The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the means by which South Africa is attempting to come to terms with its past and bring together its people to forge common goals for the future, has been an extraordinary national therapy. But some have expressed disappointment with the process because it has failed to replicate the Nuremberg trials. In contrast to the fears of the government's opponents, it has not served as an ANC kangaroo court. Instead, it has focused on gathering long suppressed details of covert killings and other political violence. Its principle has been that amnesty and indemnity would be granted only in return for such information coupled with an open apology. This may strike many victims as an inappropriately gentle way of conducting business, but it is almost certainly the only practical method and has already brought dignity to an unenviable task. There is also a palpable feeling of relief felt across the country in the very publicly shared experiences of the victims of apartheid and their families and the relentless pursuit of the true history of that suffering. I think the work of the normal hearings where people come and, and tell their stories is very important. And that's where we started, and we have no reason to change our mind about that. The catharsis that has taken place for white and black alike, men and women, old, young, seems to have done uh, something towards the reconciling work that we are committed to. My greatest fear is that it's going to go down, the perception is going to go down, that the police force from those years and the defense force from those years, we were bad, we were terrible. We made mistakes, yes, but I think there was also some good in the police forces. It was also, there was also some good in the work that we had done. Policemen also had family. Members of the defense force also had families. People who were opposed to the ANC at the time also had families. They were also victims of the violence. It's not only certain people who were victims of the violence. It was a, it was a terrible stage. I said to my wife yesterday, I said, you know, there's no winner in the war, no matter what war there is. There's only one who loses a bit less than the other, but there's no winner. There was no winner in this situation that we, were, that we found ourselves in. But policemen are apparently not the only people cynical about the Truth Commission process. From conversations, radio talk shows, and letters to newspapers, it appears that ordinary white South Africans do not associate with the Commission. In two months of hearings, very few white faces could be seen in the public gallery. There are some white people who see this as the Truth Commission, as, as addressing the needs of black people in this country. Um, without a doubt, and that's something we have to confront and face and try to turn around. I think one of the other reasons is that white people simply can't cope with hearing about the pain and the torture and the suffering. They're feeling depressed and, and kind of have the attitude of, I actually can't hear another of these stories. It's too painful. It's too depressing. Um, I actually just want to pretend it's not happening. It is very hard and very, very sad, and people feel guilty that they were not aware or that they didn't do anything at the time and so it brings that back but if we're going to bring back people's pain then I think those of us who didn't suffer like that should be prepared to face just the pain of having been around at the time and not being able to prevent it. For those who didn't want to know or did not know more likely did not want to know are finding um, solace in again not wanting to know even when the opportunity is being presented because if a person is going to say I didn't know what was happening so I can't be blamed here is now an opportunity for the nation to know what was happening but they don't avail themselves of the opportunity it's a denial sort of thing we're not out to blame and white bash as it were we're looking at what a system did and it's not only the apartheid system um, it's, it's a number of systems did to particular groups of people, and I think it's very important that we move away from the racial divide. The Truth Commission is facing a crisis of credibility right now. 
The generals of the former police force seem to have a defiant attitude, while the National Defence Force also appears rather reluctant to cooperate. South Africans are beginning to ask questions about the Commission's ability and willingness to take a firm stand in the quest for the truth about our past. Are we going to be asked to reconcile without knowing the truth? Detention without trial became a permanent feature of South African law in 1963. The General Laws Amendment Act allowed detention for 90 days, then 180 days. By 1990, 78,000 had been in custody, of whom 73 died. By the time Ahmed Timo reportedly fell to his death from the 10th story of John Foster Square late in 1971, public disbelief in falling and slipping detainees developed a hard edge. They hit my son tr tremendously. They arrested him on a Friday and they killed him and said that he committed suicide. I want to know who assaulted him and I want to know who lodged the complaint about my son. My, I, it took me quite a bit of difficulty to raise my children. It is 25 years now and that I will not forget what happened. I ask the Almighty that I will not forget what happened and that I need to know who lodged the complaint and what happened. I will not forget what happened. I need to know. So at the end of the day, while we don't know whether he was killed in detention or, or whether he actually took his own life, I think for myself the difference is not particularly substantial. What we do know is if he hadn't been detained, he wouldn't have died. For Elizabeth Lloyd, partner and fellow activist colleague of Neil Agate, who was found hanging from the steel bars of his prison cell in 1981, death was ultimately the objective of detention. Medical doctor and trade unionist, Agate was the first and last white person to die in detention. If you look at the reaction of the security police under those circumstances, um, the reaction was not so much to kind of feel bad about what they had done, but to be very angry about being caught out on it. Cornish Makanya was arrested with 14 others in Lichtenberg in June 1986. He was 18 at the time and involved in student politics. He was taken to the police station. They took this machine, connected this two cords. They put them on my head, over my head. They poured water on me and put on this machine for a long time and I continued to refuse talking. Another boy said to me, this kefir doesn't want to talk. We must just kill this heifer. They took these two pots. They put them on my private pots. After the upheavals of 1976, many of the younger generation left the country. Some of them, like Mpo Mashueng, never returned alive. The report said they were found dead in a forest in Swaziland, but the death certificate that we got was that the body was riddled with bullets. She said they found me the body, and the body was decomposed. Towards the late 80s, a number of the trained MK cadres who graduated from the military wing lost their lives in action. First, there was Anton Franch, who was killed in a seven-hour shootout with police. This week, a former MK member confessed to having given Anton Franch's hiding place away during torture. And then there was silence. Somebody shouted that it was over. In my head, I heard all the time and even now, although this time I'm also asking the same question. Who sold me to the police? Who sold me to the police? Anton died. <laughs> 
with that question on his mouth. During the early 90s, a war between the ANC and IFP swept through townships like Tokoza, Katlehong, and Fosluris. The East Rand became synonymous with death. Now, it was a usual occurrence for me to wake up every morning and go to the mortuary in search of my husband. We went to different places. We even went to Deep Kloof. Up till today, I don't know what has happened to my husband. When I got into the house, I put the light on, trying to see as to which part of me was bleeding. I switched on the light, and I kept on switching on the light on and off without seeing anything. That's when I realized that I had turned blind. My mom was approached by some people, some Zulus, and they were telling her that your child that's, who is a comrade has been shot and he's going to die. And already he has died. Sikelo Apleni was a Port Elizabeth UDF activist. He was detained in 1985. I was beaten up. Mr. X. The first person to assault me was Mr. X. He took my genitals. They opened a drawer. Fak was on the other side of the desk. He took my genitals. Mr. X, why vala it drawer? And Mr. X shut the drawer. At that time, I haven't been taken to the bridge yet. Then all my genitals were in this drawer, and the drawer was shut closed. He squeezed, squeezed my genitals. Dennis Neer, a Port Elizabeth trade unionist, was also a victim of the wild days of the states of emergency. Something was going to happen because somebody came to the front, held me at my shoulders, and then tried to kick my private parts, you know. Then I would bend. Then somebody was hitting me at my lower back with something like umpinopeke, pick Big uh, handle, something like that. Order, please. Then this would continue front and back. If I bend to the back, then this guy hits me. If I bend to the front, when he hits me, this one kicks me. There is what they call the helicopter method of torturing. They suffocated me by pulling a mask over my face. With the helicopter method, they put a stick behind your knees and you were hung upside down. Whilst this was happening, you were suffocated. The victims of ANC violence have also brought stories of their own and their family's suffering to the Truth Commission. The oppressed too often became the oppressor, and the victims' communities fell into that dull void of helplessness and confusion. It was the late 1980s, and in the burning townships, the battle lines had been drawn. You were ally or enemy. In this culture, the young lions ruled the terrain. You displayed your colors clearly or the Mpimpi tag would decide your fate, often an horrific one. As with the Masupa family in Davyton, whose house was burnt to ashes after Comrade decided that one member, Hendrik Masupa, was an informer. Phineas and Dlovu, who has spent time on death row for these killings, is now asking for amnesty for what he argues was politically motivated murder. Phineas and Dlovu was 15 years old when he joined the struggle. But part of their fight for freedom meant turning on those they saw as collaborators with the system they were fighting. People's courts and necklacing became a shameful part of the cause of the comrades. Our intention was to burn down the house. But however, things didn't go as we anticipated. 
and uh, as a result <coughs> of our actions, people died. But never there, were, there was any agreement between us to kill anyone on that set day. It was never our intention to kill. I'm sorry it ever happened. I can't sleep ever since. There is something in my conscience that says, but the cause was just. But in the process, people lost their lives. I cannot walk up tall with the head, with my head high. Whatever achievements I have, there is still something hanging in my back. And I ask of you to please, please, please consider forgiving me. Asking forgiveness from you would, would be something else. But I hear now, plead with you. I know it's difficult, but I plead with you to please consider forgiving me. I think a crime is a crime, and torture is torture. Whether it is perpetrated by a government agent or by an ANC militant, it falls in, as far as I am concerned, it falls into the same category. And I think we owe it to ourselves and to our organization to uh, investigate these kind of distortions which occurred in our ranks. But the difference is that, it, and I advisedly use the word investigate our distortions, in our case it was a distortion. It was not part of policy. It was carried out by people who themselves may have been brutalized as a result of the system of apartheid. I'm not making excuses for them. But it was against policy. It wasn't part of the deliberate um, uh, decision to engage in, in, in murder, to engage in uh, total, onslaught. total onslaught, torture, as a matter of policy. In June 1986, South Africans watched in horror as a woman got burned to death on television. Marquis Kosana's very public necklacing started a whole new trend. But few people know about the events which led to this killing frenzy in Duduza on the East Rand. Joe Mamasela, former Flakplas operative, was the first to explain his complicity in the gruesome deaths of eight people on the East Rand in 1986. But he is not the only guilty one. The steps of the other accomplices can be traced right to the top of the former nationalist government. June 26, 1986. Shortly after midnight, a group of 13 ANC activists launches a hand grenade attack on the house of a policeman on the East Rand. The grenades and a limpet mine explode in their faces. Six activists and two innocent bystanders die. The story has been told by its executioner. The cop gave me some booby trap, you know, rigged hand grenades, and one SPM limpet mine, the big one, to give to them. And then this stuff we handed to them, and they were told to choose whatever target they want. 12 midnight, and they blew themselves up. One student tried to plant the limpet mine at a power station. And it was terrible, you know, because once he started pulling off the safety pin, it went off. Uh, there was a black smoke billowing in the, in the air with a little tongue of red smoke, red flash, flashlight. And uh, one could see it was blood. It, it was terrible. The death of the activists unleashed a fury of violence in the East Rand townships. The community was blinded by anger and looking for a guilty party. At the first of two funerals, Archbishop Desmond Tutu had to save the life of a man believed to be working for the security forces. At the second funeral, Marquis Kosana had no such guardian angel. One of the first, most gruesome necklaces ended her life. When looking back, one has to ask the question, what triggered this chain of events? At the amnesty hearings this week, General Johan van der Merwe and Brigadier Jack Ronier told the nation why the grenades were booby-trapped and who gave this order. 
It was a time when the ANC had stepped up the armed struggle. General van der Merwe said it was a reaction to an intensifying people's war. In this war, he said, 270 policemen had been targeted and killed in townships between 1980 and 1990. Van der Merwe said reliable information had been received that a group of activists were planning a hand grenade attack on the house of a policeman and were awaiting the delivery of the grenades. It was his idea to jump the gun and provide the activists with the ammunition for their own deaths. I then made a recommendation to this effect. The then Commissioner of Police, General Johan Kutsier, in turn presented the recommendation to the Minister. Uh, Louis Legansi was then the Minister of Police. Mr. Legansi approved the relevant uh, recommendation. I thereafter discussed the matter with Brigadier Jack Ronnier and duly dedicated the execution of the task to him. A voorbeeld van the fact that the opdracht is soms direct from Jilbo af gekomen is the opdracht that the verleen is the General van der Merwe, to Brigadier van der Merwe, om handgranaten met zero ontstekingsmechanismes te gebruik om ANC activisten die wapens wil bekom het. Die opdracht is een springzame gegeer door generaal van de Merwe en tijdens die opdracht het hij mij specifiek meegedeel dat die opdracht direct van die minister de Grantie gekom het en dat president P.W. Bote is ook die oud-commissaris generaal Johan Koetsier daarvan gedeeld het en het goed gekeerd. At last we have the full picture. We know whose idea it was, who approved it, who gave the order and who executed the plan. Marquis Kosana was not one of the above. Marquis Kosana was fingered as the informer who gave them away to the police. Even the people who necklaced her now admit she was not an informer. <laughs> You look at your sister's body. You, you do feel it in your own body. You feel something as a sibling. Then I saw her body. I approached her from the feet, and I could identify the feet. I could identify her as my sister, but I couldn't see her face because there was a large rock on her face as well as her chest. And I went around to try and identify the body. And I was disgusted at the way she was killed. I looked at the body. Please take your time. Don't, don't feel under any, any pressure. When you're, when you're ready to continue, then. Her legs were taken apart and there were pieces of broken glass that had been pushed into her vagina. Maggie and the family have emerged after all these disclosures as a hero. I would say this hearing and this hall have witnessed, who have witnessed this testimony, are witnesses of how noble Maki was. And I will, without shame, request this house to stand and observe a moment of silence. Between September 1984 and August 1989, 771 people were necklaced or doused with fuel and burned to death. The myth perpetuated by the state then was that this was an example of African brutality. The truth we know now is that this repulsive form of killing was first started by white Rhodesian security forces in the 1970s and then brought to South Africa by the security police. Policemen burnt Supiwo Mtumkulu and Topsi Madaka to ashes in 1982 the Pepco 3 in 1985, and Sizwe Kondile in 1989. In South Africa of today, there's a clear line between gangster and vigilante or civic action. Gangs destroy communities, and groups like Pachad in Cape Town want to rebuild them. But in the shadowy history of the 1980s, some gangs and vigilante groups were seen to be cut from the same cloth. They were simply Babangalala. Vigilantes, 
right-wing and mercenary groups from within the black community who tailored their activities to suit the repressive agenda of the South African government. In the early 80s, the principal strategy used, as it were, to suppress the militancy emerging in the townships was to use basically the powers of the state, uh, mass detentions, um, attempt to use the police in particular to prevent gatherings and meetings. But it seemed to backfire. With every new method of repression, communities became more cohesive, more militant, more politically conscious. It's clear that there's always been a range of surrogate vehicles through which um, the state security apparatuses um, effectively destabilized their opponents throughout the 1980s. Um, be precisely because this is a hidden hand, the nature of so-called third forced activities has always been covert. It's very hard to establish clear evident evidence of the links between them. But there's very little doubt, just on the, on the sheer weight of information available, that there was extensive involvement, particularly of criminal youth gangs, um, in attacks on politically uh, targeted individuals and groupings. The vigilante groups which emerged had uh, revealed a really quite stark common pattern. Uh, in most cases, they were groups, disaffected groups in townships, uh, perpetrating violence mostly against UDF-aligned youth groups. Um, they seemed to operate with what I might call a, a police license. Um, they were protected from retaliatory measures, and they seemed to enjoy some form of organized support, weapons, transport, and so on. Um, as such, I would say that vigilantism is a sort of classic form of third force activities. This 1986 Bureau of Information sponsored peace song was part of the National Party's all-out campaign to win the hearts and minds of black South Africa. It perceived a total onslaught and devised a total strategy in response. A strategy characterized by reform and repression, peace songs and dirty tricks, emergency regulations and upgrading of townships. It then sold the resultant package of gruesome conflict to the world and its supporters as black-on-black -black violence. Confrontation between two groups in the black communities became evident. Those who favored evolutionary reform and revolutionaries committed to violence. The ensuing black-on-black -black violence was a horrific result of the confrontation. The government has had no choice because it's responsible for the safety of the lives and property of South African citizens to declare a state of emergency. But of course it wasn't like that, and uh, Mrs. Thatcher and so on were clearly influenced by their perspective of what they conceived of violence. By saying black on black violence, you're attempting to give a, an explanation of the causes, but it's as useful as explaining the causes of uh, the Serbian-Bosnian conflict as white on white violence. On the 2nd of December, 1988, Eleven Encarta supporters attending a night vigil were shot dead in Trustbeed, Natal. The victims were mostly women and children. Local police made no progress in finding the killers. Then Frank Dutton of the Investigations Task Unit got involved. Dutton nailed seven policemen, including none other than the new Hanover Police Station commander, Captain Brian Mitchell. In 1992, Justice Andrew Wilson was the man who sentenced Mitchell to death. This week, it was Judge Wilson's task to consider setting him free. How did a policeman charged with the task of protecting this village end up charged with the murder of 11 of its residents? Up to 1988, Brian Mitchell's story is the story of hundreds of young white South African men. He joined the police force when he was just 18 years old. During his training in 1976, he was attached to a riot unit in Soweto. Later, he spent time at Meliuskop, a police counterinsurgency base, and in 1982, he was called upon to use that training in Ibumbaland against Swapo. In his affidavit to the Amnesty Committee, Mitchell explained how he was fed and accepted a particular view of the world. 
It is only recently that he has slipped the bounds of that deep, blind loyalty he says was instilled in him and expected by the police force. Just as many uh, young black men from South Africa fled during the 1976 period and who were eventually trained as ANC terrorists, as I and many others then saw it, so my life took on a parallel whereby I was trained in counter insurgency tactics and counter revolutionary measures to stop their eventual onslaught. Well, we were led to believe that Nelson Mandela was portrayed and portrayed to be as being a monster, a communist and a violent man. Mitchell arrived in Peter Maritzburg in 1987. He was evidently good at his job because before long he was promoted to station commander at New Hanover. Here, Mitchell served on the local joint management committee. This was a structure of the total strategy. P.W. Boerter's brainchild to counter the total onslaught from the UDF unions and the ANC itself. Trustfeed was one of the villages that fell under Brian Mitchell's command. On your arrival at New Hanover, there had not been any unrest. Yes, sir, uh, that is quite correct. In the rest of South Africa, the police were only just holding the line against an increasingly ungovernable populace. The Minister of Law and Order, Adrian Flock, took the decision to supplement the police with an auxiliary force of Pitzkonstables. These special constables were recruited from the black population, trained, armed, and put back in their communities to be used as an auxiliary or third force. They were deployed in the flashpoints or the unrest areas where the violence was... Uh, and to what would they have been attached? What so, unit or what section? The special constables. To the right unit. Captain Deonta Blanche was commander of the riot unit at Hammersdale. Along with Mitchell and the Joint Management Committee, he used these special constables to drive a lethal wedge between UDF and Encarta supporters in trust feed. It was just, I think, the driving force behind it, uh, behind the motives, of, of uh, the security establishment was to drive the opponents, uh, the UDF, the, strong, the, the, the stronger side, um, out of trust feed. So that it is left within the hands of, say, uh, in this case, in Carter, that it becomes a no-go area and they can, within themselves, um, exist. Towards the end of 1988, Mitchell and Tablanche attended a meeting with Encarta leaders, including David and Tombella, where it was decided to launch an operation that would clear and hold the trust feed area for Encarta. It was an operation that was done by myself entirely uh, in, in cooperation with the riot unit. There was two operations. There was an operation, a clean-up operation before yes. in the morning, and then that evening it was... Uh, the four special constables and myself. Who gave you the instruction to kill? Was that uh, Major Tablanche? Yes, so orders came from him that uh, these comrades must be taken out. The whole operation went wrong, where the wrong people were, became victims. The killers mistook a night vigil at an Encarta household for the UDF gathering they were supposed to attack. Relatives of the dead wept as Mitchell told how he dropped the armed men off, waited while they executed the attack, and finally how he gave the instructions for the burning of another UDF activist's house. Next morning, Mitchell helped to clean up evidence that would point to the police. But in the end, the cover-up was exposed, and Mitchell's own life was in ruins. I've lost everything in life. Well, I've subsequently been divorced. Mr. Mitchell, are you now desirous of making amends? Yes, I am. Yes. Although it may be impossible to do it, but I am desirous of that. You've become a Christian and understand the value of forgiveness. Will you let us have your thoughts on that? Yes, I understand that forgiveness does not come cheaply. It's a something that comes deeply from, from the heart. And I can just ask the people that were involved directly or indirectly 
and who have been affected by this case to consider forgiving me. The community of trust feeds has also requested me to advise the amnesty committee that they will try to forgive Mr. Brian Mitchell if he becomes actively involved in the reconstruction of the community that he was responsible for destroying. Holzer House, 1988. For many years, acts of violence like this was blamed on the ANC. The ANC is a barbaric organization of murderers that don't care for the vernietiging of men's lives. But this week, for the first time, Adrian Flock and the top command of the old police force admitted our men may have murdered, killed, tortured and bombed in the line of duty. What is now emerging is that many acts of terror attributed to the ANC during the 80s were in fact committed by the South African police. Nonsense, police said. The man was crazy. Flakplas never killed anyone. A claim by a former police captain that he led a hit squad that eliminated government opponents has been firmly rejected by former police commissioner General Johan Kutsia. Attorney General Tim McNally was first appointed to investigate the death squad revelations. He found no substance in the allegations. After State President F.W. de Klerk received the McNally report, the Harams Commission of Inquiry was appointed. Kutsia testified before the commission in South Africa House in London. McNally was appointed to lead evidence at the Harams Commission. Louis Harams also found that Kutsia had lied and was mentally unstable. Despite the fact that two of Kutsia's death squad members, David Chikalanga and Almond Mofamela, also admitted their complicity in the murder of Mkenge, nobody was ever charged or apprehended. One of the people who must take responsibility for the fact that politicians and generals could go on lying and denying until the cock came clean is Mr. Justice Louis Harams. In 1990, Judge Harams led a commission of inquiry into the allegations of Dirkutsi and others about Flakplas and the death squads. His final report gave the police a virtual clean bill of health. Judge Harams then rejected virtually everything that Kutsia had said. He insulted Kutsia and repeatedly called him a liar. And he believed Eugene de Kock and his partners in crime. De Kock admitted this week that he had lied to Harams. And Dirk Kutsia, we know now, did not lie to him. Mr. Kutsia, do you know the name Ace Muhema? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. From where do you know this person? It was the name of an ANC cadre who came to Flakplas in the late 1980s, uh, 1981s, uh, towards the end of the year, as a person that had been debriefed already through all the relative channels, and he was then placed at Flakplas with me under my control. And I should just say he was a very observant, quiet, uh, if I remember right, non-smoker, non-drinker, and asked a lot of questions uh, which concerned me and the rest of the policemen at Flakplas. It At that stage, I got the impression that there might be a hidden agenda. Uh, Captain Koos Vermeeren suggested that we should take him out. Upon Meaning? Which, meaning? Meaning assassinate him. A decision is taken so flippantly and a man's life is put to an end. I am alarmed by that. I can understand it, Mr. Chairman. I think in those days a black man's life meant absolutely nothing. Mr. Harams, since then promoted to the appeal court, simply said this week, I was right. De Kock wasn't cross-examined by anyone at the commission, so why shouldn't I have believed him? If de Kock lied to me, he lied to me. Louis Harams started his final report with these words, Blessed is he who can recognize the truth. What bitter, bitter irony. Parcel bombs have often been used by the security police in their war against the ANC, especially by their foreign division at Daisy, commanded in the 1980s by former Steve Biko interrogator Colonel Piet Goersen and super spy Major Craig Williamson. Williamson has admitted that he was responsible for two parcel bombs that killed two women and a six-year-old child. Williamson has applied for amnesty at the Truth Commission. 
Williamson also admits killing leading ANC theoretician Ruth First, wife of Communist Party leader and later cabinet minister Joe Slovo. The problem we face in this country is that there's an obvious tension between uh, reparation and reconciliation, between retribution and reconciliation. I mean, at the, the moral level, the answer is absolutely clear, and that is they should all be put on trial and they should pay for the crimes that they committed. But uh, I'm afraid, looking at the kind of vision of, of the unfolding of the negotiating process is not as simple as that. And uh, this is one of the issues which in other countries as well, whether it's Chile or other places, uh, become uh, an element in the, uh, the bargain in a way which has to be struck uh, in, the, in the atmosphere of give and take. First was blown up in the Mozambican capital of Maputo in August 1982. Mozambique was an important hunting ground for South African death squads. This country nearly lost one of its most celebrated sons, academic Albie Sachs, today a constitutional court judge. In a moment of darkness, Sachs loses his arm. Four ribs are broken, his right heel fractured, his liver lacerated, his eardrums ruptured, his body full of shrapnel wounds. But he survives. It was my job to carry out operations against the ANC. I was an officer in the security forces. The security forces, I was in a particular section, the role of which was to carry out counter-revolutionary actions against the ANC and other organizations. And I did my job. Craig Williamson did his job well. His victims are scattered across the subcontinent. It's a soldier's job to kill when he's threatened and when the system that he's defending is threatened. That is the response. If the enemy is trying to kill you or trying to kill people that you are defending, your job is to kill him. From the early to the middle 80s, he headed the foreign section of the security police. He then joined military intelligence and in the latter 80s became a National Party member of the President's Council. During that time, he served on a subcommittee of the State Security Council, which did target selection. If you talking, we're talking now about target selection, we're talking about um, operations, military operations, like the operations in Masiru, uh, Maputo, Gaborone. These were full-scale military operations approved by the State Security Council, approved by the President, approved on, on top level, carried out uh, totally overtly. Williamson's amnesty application will be opposed by this man, Marius Kuhn. In 1984, Williamson sent a parcel bomb to his home in Lubangu in Angola. Marius wasn't home and his wife Jenny opened the parcel. She and their eight-year-old daughter Katrine were blown to pieces. Their two-year-old son Fritz was in the room that survived the blast. Uh, Fritzy sat on my lap, holding on to me like a little monkey, and he didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. And then he said to me, I thought the enemy had killed you as well. And then, just as we were getting into Lubongo, the airport's quite a way out of Lubongo, he said something else to me. He said, the enemy didn't kill Jenny. They just broke her in pieces. And that was, those were the only two sentences he said for about a day and a half. I thought the child was never going to speak again. Then I was taken into the flat. One wall, blood, floor to ceiling, with pieces of flesh on the floor. Uh, it was not at all a pleasant sight. I'd like you to ask the, my superiors and my political superiors and the political leaders of the country at the time who knew what I and others were doing. Did because they know? Of course they knew. Have you ever met Williamson? 
Yes, he stayed in our house when we were teaching in Malapalali in Botswana. He stayed there for either two or three nights. He's got a very good mind. He's quite convivial company. But I was never able to find out what was going on either in his head or in his heart. When you carry out operations and you are congratulated, decorated, honored, and given all the accolades of a successful officer in the, in the struggle against communism and insurgency and counter-revolution, uh, you believe that the people who are honoring you know what you did to be honored for. The way I would like to see Williamson best is through the sites of Naikai. To what extent Desmond Tutu and the Truth Commission can reconcile such a brutal and evil history with the optimism for the future has yet to be seen. There is a widespread feeling amongst blacks and coloureds in South Africa that wicked things were done directly by members of the apartheid government. Meantime, the majority of whites seem to either be in denial about the past or are deeply sceptical about the role of the Commission many seeing it simply as a talking shop for the ANC's version of this ghastly period in South African history. There's this perception that whites think this is the Kleenex Commission, so-called. Yes, I'm, I'm sad for those who feel that way. I, I was telling someone in one of the African newspapers, I said, you know, we are very lucky. We are lucky that we don't want to treat you as you treated us. We are lucky that... Uh, Despite the kind of things that you've done to us, we are willing to stretch out our hands in reconciliation. Please don't spurn this opportunity. Please, for your sake, for the sake of your children. And we hope, as I keep saying at ad adherence, that the generosity from the survivors and victims would have an answering generosity that of those who benefited to say sorry. And he says,